Of the some 70,000 currently cataloged insects, only about 400 are pestiferous or damaging to crops. And of these 400, there are only about 40 that are serious pests. 70,000 currently cataloged insects, only about 400 are pestiferous or damaging. Hmm. A little feedback. <clears throat> Since garden health depends on a lively balance of biological diversity, I make it my business to tell them apart. Potential garden pests come in three main flavors. Vertebrates, the ones with clear cut inner skeletal systems, mainly mammals and birds. Invertebrates, spineless pests, mainly insects and plant diseases, including fungal, bacteria and viral infestations. When it comes to responding to plant, to plant pests and diseases, there are three primary types of gardeners. The vigilant, ever ready, and observant gardener expects and waits pest attack and is prepared to respond directly when it comes. The gardener, more like me, meets all calamity with the belief that the solution lies in building better soil and root health and maintaining sustainability, fertility in the garden. And all is well until it isn't gardener relies on blithe optimism instead of martial response. My type of gardener often fails to notice the first wave of pests when they arrive because we're busy ministering to the soil and the plants. <clears throat> I have lost a lot of early summer arugula to the infamous flea beetle by assuming that arugula plants were weakened by lax fertility rather than by insect attack. My vigilant friends hard at work with their Hand lenses notice the arrival of this musical pest that renders arugula into lace, but while bracing for imminent pest attack, they may fail to maintain basic garden fertility. The best preventative. The blithe laissez fair gardener is often left scurrying to catch up with a ballooning infestation. Good pest response depends on merging these styles of gardening. If you over fertilize, your plants will be pumped and succulent, announcing themselves loudly to visiting pests or to disease spores of mold, fungus, and other pathogens. If you under fertilize and worry about pest attack all the time, your, plant, your garden will also suffer, and so will you. There is a middle way between these two extremes that allows for relaxation and enjoyment of the garden. The key to finding and keeping this balance is open minded awareness, not control. No matter how much you want to have just the right guests come to your house, uninvited pests will also arrive hungry and long fanged in your garden gate. Once you stop, look, and listen long enough to recognize that you have a pest or destructive disease in your garden, sink down to ground level and notice what exactly is happening to your plants. There is a sensitive balance here between monitoring mindfully and waiting too long. So take Gote's advice, don't hurry, do not rest, and respond in a timely fashion. Beautiful, that was a really nice ponder. Thanks for that. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, tonight, everyone, we are gonna stay on that theme and we are welcoming Jay White, and he's zooming in from, I think, Brenham. Um, I think Brenham. Let me uh, make sure I've got my on the restream. Um, so yeah, so um, you know, Jay is the publisher of the Texas Gardener Magazine, and. Um, everyone may recognize that name. When you become a member of Austin Organic Gardeners, you get a code, a discount code for subscription. Um, so yeah, so he's going to be talking about uh, pest-free organic Lee uh, tonight. And so Jay, are you with us? I am. Hello. Did I get your location right? <laughs> you did. I am in the home of Bluebell Ice Cream. <laughs> So, Brenham near the Rose Emporium. I I am. He um, uh, they're actually on the other side of the county, but um, I'm there a lot. So I love the place. It is beautiful, and this year has been incredibly beautiful. I don't I don't know if y'all have noticed, but it seems like <laughs> this is my theory. I think plants realize that they really almost died this winter, 
And so they're really going crazy and putting on a huge show. I mean, my roses are incredible. You know, the, the fruit trees that hadn't bloomed before the freeze have gone nuts. So um, I, it's been a lovely, lovely year to go to the Antique Rose Emporium. That's for sure. Near death experience. Yep. <laughs> a good one. So. Yeah. Doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. That is true. So... <laughs> Well, do you want to go ahead and get started with the um, presentation? Yeah, yeah. Let me pull that up. Just give me a second here. Now, I did um, I, I did make a couple of changes, but I mean, we can go off of yours. The only thing that I, I is drastically different is I did create a new discount code for the uh, group tonight. Okay. So I wasn't sure the status of the last one. Some people had said they'd had trouble using the last one. Okay. So um, well, I can just talk about that or? I think um, I, in the past, like uh, presenters, they like to share their own screen. That way they can like um, control, like going to the next slide. So if, if you want to do that, or I can share and kind of like feel your pace and go to the next slide. Yeah, well. let, if you don't mind, let me, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay, perfect. And, and then like say, it will have all the um, updated information and all of that. Perfect. So can y'all see it? Yep. All right. Well, first of all, y'all, I want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I'm really excited to speak to you guys. And I really wanted to tell y'all, um, number one, I am very, very impressed with the way your club um, attracts speakers and, and promotes the speakers. I, I work with a lot of groups. I've done several um, Zoom presentations over the last year, and I'm going to tell you, you guys are tops in the promotion of your speakers. And I, I mean, big, big hand. I don't know who's doing it, but you guys are really doing an outstanding Good job. Good job, Angel! So, yeah. Uh, I went to school for propaganda. I'll admit hey, it. Yay, Angel. <laughs> Average well, school, it paid off. <laughs> well, it was, it, it's awesome, guys. I'm not kidding. I mean, just everything there, your artwork's good. You're, you know, you're, you're just on it. So my hat's off to you. And thank you very much for asking me. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. I really do. Um, I, I'm looking forward to speaking to your group. So, I want to tell you a little bit about Texas Gardener. If you're not familiar with Texas Gardener, um, I'm going to, I can't believe I didn't have the slide in there. How many, uh, this is the only thing I don't like about Zoom meetings is when I'm, I'm talking, I get a little worked up. I, I'm a little um, high energy at times. And so I love being in person and walking around and getting people's feedback. And so I can't see anybody. So that, that's, that's a little bit hard for me. But just let me tell you, I usually say, let me see a show of hands. How many people have either heard of my magazine or take my magazine? Um, if you've not, just let me tell you a little bit about it real quick. We are in our 40th year. And I think all of us are internet savvy enough to know that publishing is a tough business in the world of the internet. And I think the reason that Texas Gardener has stayed around for 40 years is because we really do produce a nice product. And the reason it's 100% is our relationship with AgriLife and our writers. I mean, our tagline is we are the magazine for Texas gardeners by Texas gardeners. We are 100% Texan. All of our writers are degreed professionals or highly, um, they, they have a lot of experience as lay gardeners, like Patty Leander, who's our vegetable specialist, who's right there in Austin. I'm sure many of y'all have heard her talk through the years. You know, she's got a, a BA or a BS in nutrition. And a lot of our writers have master's degrees and PhDs. So one thing that we're very proud about and that we really uh, talk about is we believe in teaching people the science of agriculture. And so I don't know if any of y'all are familiar um, with this, but I hadn't figured out the clicker. I'm sorry, I'm moving it around. But we're going to tell you things, what we're going to talk about tonight, 
there's nothing, uh, there shouldn't be anything controversial in what I say tonight. It's just simply science, okay? Everybody talks to me, and I, I've noticed this throughout the years, that, you know, everybody wants to know how to grow a plant. And typically when they come to you and say, you know, well, I haven't had any luck with this, the reason they're coming to you is because they've killed a plant. And through the years, it kind of dawned on me that you have two choices when you take care of anything, okay? You can nurture it and you can give it the things that it needs to thrive, or you can not give it all the things it needs to thrive and it will not do as well or it will perish. And it doesn't matter if it's an animal or a plant. And so what we're gonna talk about is the science between behind, well, there's a science in agriculture. And then we're also gonna use that science. Typically when people give these presentations, they're gonna tell you, you know, how much of this to put on your plant or whatever to make your plant grow. What I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna turn that on its end and I'm gonna use science and, bio, and biology, pri primarily the science of biology, to show you how to kill things. So we're gonna kill weeds, bugs, funguses, things like that. So we have a little bit of a problem tonight. My wife is not here and she is the one that always watches me and tells me, Jay, you're talking way too much. <laughs> and so I have set a timer so if you hear that go off, that's my reminder to kind of start slowing down and wrapping it up. But I do like for these to be fairly interactive. So please, if you have a question, send a question. Angel, I assume you are you can moderate and you can get all these questions to us. Zoom meetings do seem to work better if we wait and hold them to the end though. So, but please, you know, feel free to ask questions. I, I love questions. So I do want to put out here, I created a new code today. Our magazine's just $24.95. So I tell people that's already pretty cheap, but I'm going to give people a 25% discount to try our magazine for one year. So if you'll go to our website and you will go to the one year subscription, when you go to the cart, you can enter the, the code today as AOG51021. And I'm going to leave that out there through next Sunday. And so that will give you 25% off the magazine. So instead of $24.95, you'll be able to get it for um, $18.71. So um, I hope you all will take advantage of that. All right. So when I give this, I've never talked to an all organic group before. So some of these slides you'll have to understand. These are designed for, for your traditional gardener. So I always start out with what does organic mean? Well, to me, the simplest answer of what is an organic gardener is that organic gardeners don't use synthetic fertilizers, they don't use synthetic herbicides, and they don't use synthetic pesticides. And so what I like to tell people is of those three things, the fertilizers, the herbicides, and the pesticides, what are the most, you know, we, we deal with a lot of people who say, well, I want to be mostly organic, you know, so what is the thing that, you know, I could, I could cheat on if I, if I didn't want to be fully organic. Well, I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, the things that you cannot cheat on if you want to be considered an organic gardener is what we call the sides. I don't think that you can really call yourselves organic if you're going to fight your pests with chemicals, okay? And as we go through, we'll talk about, we all know why. You know, synthetic pesticides, they will kill everything. Now, I do wanna point out that organic pesticides will do that as well in some cases. I mean, we all, we have to use everything within, um, you know, it's labeled instructions. But I do not, I think if I could leave this world with, with one thing, I would tell people, please avoid herbicides and pesticides especially if you're growing things that you're going to eat. Okay, so what this talk is really based on is when I was at A&M, I got a chance to work in their greenhouses. And so this is where everybody has all of their research topics and every, all their research projects and all. And I got to work in the greenhouses and, and I'd never been in a greenhouse before. And I found these greenhouses fascinating, okay? And one thing that was very fascinating to me was that these greenhouses are the perfect environment for disease. 
They're the perfect environment for disease and pests. So they're always warm and they're always moist and they're always wet, all right? And so they're a perfect, perfect place for diseases to get out of a hand, to get outbreaks of insects, especially things like thrips and white flies and aphids and things like that. And so I noticed as I was doing that, that the greenhouses, while they did have a, a, an occasional outbreak of some pest, they controlled them pretty well. And they didn't like to use pesticides. Now this was at a &M, which was a research institute but I also got to travel around and tour a lot of commercial greenhouses. And one thing that I learned about commercial greenhouses is they don't like to use what we call the sides either, the pesticides or the herbicides. And the reason that they don't, and is because consumers do not like the pesticides. They don't want the pesticides and the herbicides brought in their house or put in their garden. And so they can actually charge more for their product if they grow it without a synthetic, without, without synthetic chemicals. All right. So how do they do that? Well, they control it with a method that we call IPM. So IPM stands for the integrated pest management triangle. So if I, I know you've all seen these before, they use these triangles to, you know, illustrate many things, but basically you have three things that you can do to control pests in your garden, in the greenhouse, wherever you are. You have what we call cultural, mechanical, and physical mechanical and physical, and then chemical and biological. And if you'll notice, the base of the triangle are the cultural methods. So this is where we're going to put the majority of our work, the majority of our effort, and it's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. <clears throat> After that, we're going to move up the triangle, and if we still have a problem, we're going to apply mechanical and physical means. And then as a very last resort, we will move into what we call chemical and biological controls. So let's talk about some of these cultural control methods. Y'all, this is just my little saying here, but I like to tell people that good gardeners do not grow plants. I wish I could see your hands because I like to, I like to see how many people agree with that. Woo, put your hands up. Good gardeners do not grow plants. What do good gardeners grow? Soil. Soil, they grow microbes, they grow soil microbes. Ding, 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 ding. And that's the other thing. If I was there in person, I'd be walking around with handouts and I'd be giving you stuff. I, I feel bad. I miss that part. But anyway, successful gardeners grow healthy soils. All right. I got to, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. People, the world has been growing plants for a long, long time. In fact, the world grew plants for millions of years before there ever were people on it. So plants are designed to grow. What we as humans need to do is we need to develop the environments that allow those plants to thrive, okay? So good gardeners grow healthy soil. The other thing I like to tell people is grow crops that are recommended for an area. Now, <clears throat> one thing I learned at AM is that when you buy a plant from a nursery, I tell people you should do two things. The first thing that you should do is you should read the plant tag. And people kind of laugh at this, but I'm not, I'm not really being funny. This is really the truth. When I tell you this, somebody got a PhD to write that plant tag. And people find that kind of odd, but I'm telling you, when I was at A&M, one of the um, little uh, research projects that was going on was Angelonia. Are y'all familiar with Angelonia? It's a very hardy, heat-loving flower that does very well here in, in Texas, kind of upright like a lupine, very low water requirement, great, great plant for Texas gardeners. And there was a girl there that was getting her PhD, and she was trying to figure out how much drought stress Angelonia could take. Well, once she had figured out everything there was to know about Angelona, then they would take her research to write up those little plant tags that they put in each one of those little four inch pots or six inch pots, whatever you buy of Angelonia. So it's going to tell you the light requirements, the water requirements, the soil requirements. It's gonna tell you it's um, hardiness zones. How many people before this February freeze how many people looked at your plant tags to see what is the hardiness zone that this plant can grow in? 
You know, not very many people did. Most people assumed that if they sold that plant in this area, that it was fine in this area. And what we learned, and we have to relearn every once in a while because these freezes don't come too often, is that there are a lot of plants that will grow well here until it gets five to eight degrees. And, and then we will actually lose a bunch of plants. So I tell people, read those plant tags. You need to grow plants that are recommended for your area. One thing that I was, what I used to have that on there before the February freeze, I had that on there for things like forsythia and things like that. So these are lovely shrubs that they grow from Dallas up north. It doesn't mean you can't grow them in Austin or Central Texas, but it means you're going to have to baby them. You're going to have to give them some special care and all of that, and they're not going to thrive. And I heard, um, who read that, that thing about the pests earlier? I, I was listening to when y'all were having that, that reading from that book, and they that said was, something about, me. I'm sorry? That was me. Yeah, that was a very good reading, okay? That, that was a very good reading. Because it said something about when you fertilize, you're going to make your plant super plump and super attractive to the pests, right? Well, anything, I am, you know, pests have evolved right along with these plants. And I can guarantee you that a pest can sense a healthy plant and it can sense a diseased plant. And diseased plants draw in pests, okay? So... I just encourage people grow crops recommended for your area. You're going to have less problem when it comes to these periodic freezes that we have, the periodic droughts that we have, and with your pests. Another thing that we talk about is crop rotation. Just real quickly, I usually ask, let me, okay, who would believe that one of the most populous animals on the face of the earth is a nematode? Does that not kind of blow your mind? Okay, that kind of stuff really blows my mind. Two of the most popular animals on the whole face of the earth are ants and nematodes. They grow on every continent except Antarctica. They're adapted to all kinds of soils and all of that. And why am I talking about nematodes? I mean, if you garden in central Texas, then you're gonna have nematodes, especially in your vegetable garden. You're, they're gonna attack your brassicas, they're gonna attack your tomatoes, your peppers, um, basically everything, okay? So you can help control these soil-borne pests by periodically rotating your crops. So if you plant your okra in the same place every year for three or four or five years, you're going to build a super infestation of nematodes in that area, and you're just going to slowly become less and less successful with your okra, all right? Another thing is control weeds. Now we say control weeds and everybody understands that we need to control weeds because why? So I'm gonna tell you, there's really a couple of ways to kill things. There, there's a couple of very effective ways to kill things. If you deprive a plant of water or light, you're gonna kill that plant, okay? It's, it's that simple. Those are two things that that plant really needs to, to live. So if you let weeds get out of control in your gardens, just understand, especially, especially in Austin. Okay, you guys, don't you still, I, I don't want to be making up stories here, but don't y'all still have a mandatory watering schedule that is in place in Austin during the summer? Is that, is that an every year occurrence that happens with you guys? Yes. It yes. is. Stage, stage and that's because, one. I'm sorry? Yeah, they call it stage one year round. Okay. Well, I can tell y'all, Austin is at the forefront of, of kind of having a problem with this, but I'm telling you, the entire state and country are going to start experiencing what you guys are going through. And so this is one reason I tell people to control weeds. Water is going to become much more precious to us each and every day that goes by. I'm working on another presentation right now, and I, I just did some math the other day, and based on the census re results, 1,085 people moved to Texas every day in the last 10 years. That's unbelievable. Okay, Austin, your aquifers are already being taxed like, you know, it, it's bad. So one of my daughters lives in Wimberley. This is going to happen more and more often. A company went in, bought product, uh, bought land. They did everything right. They got all the permits. They were going to put in a golf course. 
and they were going to put in a housing res or a housing addition around this golf course. The people that support Jacob's Well and the other aquifers around Wimberley, they took them to court and they said, this golf course will reduce the surface water that's coming out of these aquifers and it's going to dry up Blue Hole and Jacob's Well and things like that. And the state of Texas, as conservative and pro-business as the state of Texas is, they stood with the conservationists and they prevented that golf course from going in. They said, you can build the houses, but we're not going to let you build the golf course. And that's because they have the foresight to understand water is going to be a big problem for us in the coming years. And so control your weeds. I, I tell people, control your weeds and use drip irrigation. If you do that, you're going to greatly reduce your disease. You're going to reduce the competition for water and nutrients that the plants you want to grow have. And so it's a win-win. Control those weeds. Another thing with controlling weeds, <clears throat> have y'all ever noticed how many people have ever gone out to the garden and looked at their tomato plants during the day, okay? A lot of times those tomato plants are gonna be covered with what are called leaf-footed bugs. Some people call them stink bugs. They've got all these different names, but leaf-footed bugs. So they're on the top of the leaves and when you try to get them, they go under the bottom of the leaves, right? Where do you think they go at night? They go into the weeds and debris, okay? So they go in and they hide in the weeds and debris at night. So if you wanna help control that, also grasshoppers. How many people have had a grasshopper infestation before? Grasshoppers are horrible. They lay their eggs in weeds. And so one place that, you know, you can keep your property spotless, but if the property across the street has high weeds growing up against, uh, a fence, well, that's where the grasshopper is going to go and lay her eggs. So keep your weeds under control. All right, here's another thing. Plant many types of vegetables as opposed to a single type. And what this is, is this is to limit infestations. It's limit, you know, the attractive amount of certain plants to pull in a huge infest infestation of bugs. Several years ago, I planted a whole row. So my little garden here at home, it's about 50 by 50. And so I planted about a 35 foot row of winter squash. Once that winter squash all flowered, and I did a several varieties of, of winter squash because my wife and I love to decorate our front porch with things that we grow. And so I had, you know, the Turks turban and the red warty thing and all of this. So it all starts growing, it all starts blooming, and all of a sudden, a pest I had never seen before in my life. And I've been gardening here in the same spot for 16 years, and all of a sudden, these little green bugs that look like green ladybugs showed up, and they wiped out that row of squash, okay? Completely wiped it out. They were cucumber beetles. Now, I'd never seen them before, but evidently, having a 35-foot row of winter squash flowers was enough to attract a huge infestation. So point is, if all I had tried to grow was winter squash that year, I'd have been in trouble because I lost, I lost all my winter squash, right? Another thing, space plants properly. You'll see this especially with tomatoes and things that get really big. Uh, large plants, when they get together, Number one, it reduces airflow, so wet plants don't dry off as quickly, so that encourages funguses and bacteria and viruses to spread. But the other thing it does, it gives pests a place to live. So sp uh, space plants properly, read that tag. Clean up mulch and debris. Now I'm gonna tell you one other thing. I love little true factoid things that we can use that are um, th that work, okay? Remember those leaf-footed bugs that I told you, how they hide in the, the debris and everything in your, your garden? If you want to kill a whole bunch of leaf-footed bugs, give them some debris. So turn everything on its head. And the degree, the debris that you want to give them, I'm sorry, you want to give them shingles. If you have asphalt shingles, if you can find asphalt shingles, cedar shakes, whatever kind, something that's thin and pliable, Put that on the ground around your plants 
Those leaf-footed bugs will go under there at night to stay warm. When you go out in the morning, just walk around on top of those shingles and boom, you're going to kill a whole bunch of leaf-footed bugs without using any kind of pesticide or herbicide, okay? Another thing, if we want to keep disease down, I recommend sanitizing your hand tools, especially your hand tools. You know, I keep a pair of, of clippers in my pocket all the time. I probably mix up a little bleach solution every two or three months, just put them in there, wipe them off. I don't want to spell, spread disease. And I can tell you, it's very easy. I have a large collection of Narcissus and Narcissus, there is a virus that gets in Narcissus. Um, and so I have to be very careful because I've had that virus. So you want to stay on top of that, keep your tools clean and sanitized. All right, now we're going to move up the triangle. So those were some of the cultural control methods that we were going to use. Now we're going to go into what we call the mechanical and physical um, control method, me measures. I'm a little tongue tied. So the first thing I tell people is observe. This is another little thing that I, I like to say. You know what the most important thing is that you can put in your garden? It's your shadow, okay? Successful gardeners are in their garden. They're in their garden every day. They're out there watching, they're observing, they're, they're checking out what's going on. And if you're out there, you're gonna notice a lot of problems before they become a problem. How many of y'all have had the squash vine borer before? You know, if you've grown squash in our area, you pretty much have, have had the squash vine borer. Well, let me tell you, the squash vine borer has a little telltale thing that kind of gives her presence away. She flies around in the morning. They typically lay their eggs in the morning. So if you're out in your garden in the morning, you can hear her. She sounds like a giant mosquito. You can literally hear her buzzing. So when you're out there, you can hear her. You'll know she's there. So you can watch for her. And after she leaves, you know you need to start turning up the leaves of your plant and looking to see where she laid, laid, laid eggs. And you need to learn to recognize those eggs. You need to remove them from the undersides and squeeze them, okay? Another thing, how many have seen the bugs that I have here in this picture? This picture actually came from Patty Leander in Austin, okay? Those are called Harlequin bugs. These are a pest that are a huge problem in the fall for a lot of us, and they love our brassicas. So they love your broccoli, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, and all of that. You know, these are a hard, these are a beetle. These are a flying beetle. And so very few things that we're going to talk about in the chemical controls will get to them because these are mature bugs. But they're not very smart and they're not very fast. So you literally can pick them off, drop them in some water with some soap, and they will drown, okay? So now let's go real quick while this comes up. Why do we put soap in water? Soap does two things. And we're going to talk about some homemade concoctions and everything. But if you notice in that picture, that water is gray, correct? And that's primarily because of the soap that was put in there. So water is a suffocant. And what, su what it does as a suffocant is it breaks the surface tension of the water because a lot of the bugs that we can pull off and put in that water, their feet are actually designed to, to be able to walk on water. So what you need to do if you're going to try to pick off bugs and dispose of them this way is you need to break the surface tension of that water, and that's what the soap will do for you, okay? Certain things like aphids. Aphids, little factoid or whatever, aphids do more damage to horticultural crops than any other pest on the planet, okay? There is a specified, there is a specialized aphid for almost every class of plants. Well, aphids, they are born on the plant. They crawl around on the plant. They work just like a mosquito on the plant. They put their little suckers in. <clears throat> and then they have, there is so much what is called turgor pressure inside the xylem and the phloem of a plant that when they plug into that xylem, then boom, the water just passes through on the, the sugar water, comes out of their tail ends. If you're ever under any kind of tree this summer and you feel yourself getting misted, or, you know, you feel this light stuff, that's aphid poop, okay? Or aphid excrement. 
It's coming through those things. It's falling out on the ground. And if you have crepe myrtles, you've seen this very, very well, especially from your scale insects. They'll excrete this honeydew, and then it will call in the sooty mold, which will grow over it. And your crepe myrtles, your bark and your leaves will turn black. Well, you need to control those with strong sprays of water and you need to spray up from the bottom and you need to do it a lot, okay? I tell people we can control pests just as well organically as we can synthetically, but if we're gonna do that, we have to be a little more diligent with our organic pest control regimens, okay? So if I say spray your um, plants with, with hard blasts of water, you can't go out and spray them now and not go back till July. You're gonna to need to spray those plants probably every four or five days. And why are we doing it every four or five days? This is gonna be the case when we get and talk to some of these chemical control methods and all too. Why are we gonna treat things every four or five, six, seven days when we're doing organics? Well, the reason we're gonna do that is because we're trying to get ahead of the life cycle of these animals. So these animals don't all show up say on May 10th and lay their eggs. Some of them came and laid their eggs on May 1st. Some of them laid them on the 3rd. Some of them laid them on the 10th. And so you're going to have these animals hatching at different times and going through the different phases of their life cycle at different times. And so if you want to be effective on them, anything that we do to them works best if we get them when they're young. And so you need to hit it two, three, four, five times to make sure that you hit those pests in each phase of their life cycle and, and finally wipe them, wipe them out. Now, the next one that I have come to love are mechanical barriers and row covers. How many of y'all grow under row cover? Y'all, I, I used to did not do this, but I have two of the worst pests in any garden um, in America, okay? One of them is the cotton-tailed rabbit, and the other one is Gaius domestica, the common chicken, all right? So we have chickens. They tear up everything. But unfortunately, my wife really loves those chickens, and she really loves those bunnies, okay? So all I can do is try to learn how to live in harmony with them. So what I have learned is I grow almost everything, everything that will grow neatly in a row. So your beans, your squash, things like that. I grow under a row cover. Now, I don't put a heavy frost cloth like you put down in February. They have very lightweight stuff that allows plenty of light to get through and all of that. I water my plants with drip irrigation, so water's not a problem. And then I always get the, pro the question about, well, how do you pollinate them? Well, this is another thing where I talk about the science of horticulture. A lot of people don't realize this, but many, many, many of the plants that we grow in our vegetable gardens are self-pollinating. Okay, so tomatoes, self-pollinating. Peppers, self-pollinating. Green beans, self-pollinating. Black-eyed peas, self-pollinating. Corn, self-pollinating. Really, the only things that do not self-pollinate are the cucurbits, okay? So anything in that squash family, they do have to be hand pollinated if you're going to grow under row cover. But you can grow many, many things under cover. And I promise you, if you want to have a beautiful garden, grow things under cover. You know, take it off every once in a while and check. But this will keep your pest damage to a minimum. All right. I, I've truly become enamored with growing under row cover. The next thing that we're going to talk about are a few traps. Okay, here are some traps that you can put in your garden. So let's real quick knock out the saucers of beer. Okay, everybody knows saucers of beer, the snails, the slugs, all of them love it, right? I mean, and it is true. I'm not knocking it. It's true. Everybody knows that it's done. I'm going to tell you two that aren't done so much. One of them is directly from the greenhouse. I place yellow sticky traps all over my garden. Why do you think sticky traps are yellow? Does anybody want to give a guess? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Because Zoom does not lead to interaction. I apologize. The reason sticky traps are yellow, here's another one of those little scientific factoids that I like to share with people. The most common color of flowering plants in the natural world is yellow. Because of that, almost 
every pest is attracted to yellow. That's why yellow sticky traps are yellow sticky traps as opposed to pink or purple or whatever. They're yellow because they tra attract bugs. So sticky traps are easy to use. They're cheap. You can buy them on Amazon. I get mine off of Amazon. I get a sheet of 100 for about $10 and they're eight and a half by 11. They're so big, I cut them up and I get four sticky traps out of each sheet. I just simply poke a hole, put a zip tie on them. I grow almost everything in my garden on support, behind cages, something like that. So I can put these sticky traps out. Very, very effective, very, very cheap, zero toxicity. Incredible things. Now, the other thing that we have is buckets of soapy water with lights. And so this is a, a cool thing that I learned from Dr. Joe Masabni. Uh, I, I hope some of y'all follow him or have, have heard him speak. Um, he is one of the AgriLife um, extension agents who actually likes organics and has done experiments and all with organics. This is something he taught me. If you will put buckets of water out in your garden with soap in them, and then you will put some kind of light above that. So I use a chicken brooder light because that's what I have. I have these lights that you can clamp onto bars and things like that. So it's very easy for me to put a bucket of water in my garden with soap in it, drive in a T-post, clamp one of these like drop lights that you would use to work on your car and leave it overnight. When you come back in the morning, it's going to be full. Okay, it's, it's going to have a lot of dead bugs in it. All right. So those are great, great bug traps, very, inexpe very inexpensive, very easy to use. So now, let me check my time, 7.13. We're going to move on to chemical and biological control methods. These are our last resorts, and we want to use these sparingly, okay? I'm sure you, people, you, you folks all know this, but when I talk to a lot of groups, they're unaware. They think that just because it's natural, it's good or it's healthy. Well, I tell people arsenic and creosote are both natural, but neither one of them are good for you. So, um, so we do have, these are pesticides, okay? These are just organic pesticides. So BT, it's the oldest organ organic chemical compound that we've known about BT. It was actually discovered sometime in the early 1900s. And they knew even back then that it made some animals sick and it even killed some. So this is one of the um, more established um, chemical control methods that, that have been around for a long time. But I will tell you, it's good for caterpillars and soft-bodied pests. And so once again, the sooner you hit the pests with your organics, the better. So you want to spray on a fairly regular basis because you want to get those things right after they hatch. You don't want to wait until they're, they're, they're fully grown, okay? Another thing that I will tell you about these organic pesticides is that you want to mix them for a single use. Sunlight degrades them fairly rapidly. For BT, it will be completely inert in 48 hours. And the reason that I tell people that is because a lot of people like to mix up, you know, a two gallon sprayer and then they think they'll go back and they'll spray on Monday and on Thursday and on Sunday. Well, that really doesn't work. It, it's going to be inert by the time you get to that second or third spray. Okay, the other one that we have is spinosad. Spinosad supposedly kills some things that are a little tougher. It will kill some bigger caterpillars. It'll kill leaf miners. And they say it will kill fire ants. Okay, I've used it on fire ants and... It might have killed some of them, but I was not successful killing the queen. I mean, it, it did not wipe out mounds for me, but it is very good for some caterpillars, leaf miners, things like that. Um, so it also breaks down easily in the heat. So use it as a last resort, I tell people, because spinosa is something that will kill bees. So if you're interested in, in protecting your pollinators or whatever, you're going to want to be very, um, you, you want to use your spinosad sparingly. All right, here are some other things. Neem, neem is fine, but neem is also toxic. And so I tell people don't 
I don't recommend using neem in the vegetable garden at all. A lot of people do, but if you do, give it a time, give it time to wash off and degrade and get off of the plants. I also tell them don't put it on things like broccoli and things like that. If it gets on a smooth surface thing, it's like a tomato, you can wash that off. It's very hard to wash it off a, a head of broccoli or a head of cauliflower. All right, I'm not a big fan of predators like lady beetles and praying mantises. I love them and you should do everything in your power to encourage them into your garden. One thing that I do is I plant what I call trap crops. So I always plant various flowers in my gardens every year. And that's gonna bring in the things that are gonna attract the native ladybugs and the native praying mantises. But I don't like introducing foreign species. And these lady beetles that you get and the praying mantis that you get from your local stores that you order on the internet, you don't know where they're from. I, I guarantee 99% of the time they're not from Austin. And so I like, I don't like introducing species. Okay, the next one that we're going to talk about real quick are homemade concoctions, because there are some things that we can Malika? make. Yes. I'm sorry, I thought that was Malika. Okay, so one, here are some of the categories of the kind of sprays. You can mix these up, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want on these, but it is a true statement that smell will repel a bunch of bugs. I tell people, if you want to have a pest-free garden, what you need to be growing is onions, garlics, and leeks, okay? Nothing eats them. Nothing eats onions, garlics, and leeks. I mean, I've heard gophers and moles do. I don't really have that problem in, in the black clay. So I don't want to say nothing eats them, but very few things bother the Aleum family. So if you want to have no pests, grow onions and garlic, okay? Because of that, you can use onions and garlic and these strong smelling things like fish oils, neem, each one of these things will deter certain pests, okay? You can also put heat in it. And so the capsaicin, some pests are sensitive to it, others are not. Um, a lot of people, you know, think that they can mix up something and spray on their tomatoes and it'll keep the squirrels and the birds off. Well, it won't keep mockingbirds off and it really won't keep squirrels off either. But there are some things that hot peppers will, the, the cat station will keep it off, okay? And then you also have your neem, your horticultural oils and your vegetable oils. All of those things are good for things like scale insects that you want to coat. You can put a couple of drops of soap in there. And what that soap will do is it will make the water droplets that come out of that break up into a much smaller spray. So it will do a much better job of coating these animals. So when you put oils in a spray, you always need to put a couple of drops of dishwashing soap in there to help it disperse, okay? So, and then soap solutions, as we've talked about, they will, um, they will kill, they will, especially scale insects. So anything that you can coat and clog the respiratory system of a lot of these animals or along their shell, the more mature animals, spray them with oils, okay? Best you've got. All right, so here we're gonna talk about cultural controls of weed control. I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. Do not let your weeds go to seed. There's an old saying that says one, yeah. year of, one year of seeds equals seven year of weeds. And that is very, very true. One of the worst pests that I fight in my garden is called purple bindweed. I garden in an area that used to be cotton country. And if you have, were in cotton country, you have bindweed. It's the native marigold. They have done tests where that the weed seeds from um, purple bindweed or white bindweed can stay dormant for 25 to 30 years in the soil and then sprout. So you really do, if you're gonna have weeds, pull them before they set seed, all right? Um, some things that you can do, you can plant close together. There's a saying that says, everywhere the sun hits the soil, God plants a seed. Okay, all that really means is that light is one of the things that, that seeds need to germinate. If you deprive the light from that soil, you're gonna get much fewer weeds germinating. And then drip irrigation is gonna deprive weeds of the water and it's gonna put the water just where you need it on whatever plant it is you're trying to keep alive. 
So I tell people the most important thing you can put in your garden is your shadow. Well, that is true. But right up there, I'd say equally tied with your shadow is mulch. Mulch, 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 mulch. If you want to be a good gardener, go into your garden every day and put some more mulch out, okay? Another thing that I tell people, you know what the difference is between mulch and compost? Six months, okay? That's kind of a horticultural joke. So that's about as good as it gets, guys. That's the best joke I've got. But it's not a joke. It's true. If you put an organic substance out as a mulch and you let it set there, where it comes in contact with the soil, it is going to interact with the microbes and the microorganisms and everything, and it is going to break down and it's going to slowly become a part of your active living soil. So keep that in mind. Mulch, 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 mulch. There almost, almost is no such thing as too much mulch, okay? Now, some of my favorite things to mulch with are paper and cardboard. I like paper and cardboard. If you'll see there in the picture, what I will do a lot of times when I am trying to mulch down an area and suppress, why is this going to kill? This is going to kill because I'm going to deprive everything under that of the light that those seeds need to germinate. Or if they don't need light to germinate, when they come up, they're not going to have the light that they need to photosynthesize and grow beyond that pre-emergence or that, you know, first emergent state. So I like to put down paper and cardboard. Uh, they decompose, they become a part of the soil, but they are very effective at controlling light to the ground. Okay, here are literally, these are my favorite, favorite, favorite methods of controlling weeds in the garden. Okay, number one, my number one favorite, favorite, favorite. Everybody complains about the heat in Texas, right? Oh God, it's so hot in Texas. I hate Texas summers, blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, we all hate it. It's hot, okay? 106, 107 is hot, okay? But you might as well use that heat to do something good for you in the garden. So if you get a huge infestation of weeds that you can't control, because there are some weeds that are just bad, okay? So um, for me, I have a native spider wart here that is horrible. It's, it's almost like nutsedge. It, it puts on tons of roots, puts little nodules on it. It's horrible, horrible weed. So when I can't control that anymore by manual pulling or by the chemicals that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit, I will take the weed eater. I will mow that area down to the ground. I will saturate it with water. And then I will cover it with an opaque plastic. I, I like six or eight mil poly that I will put down. Then I will surround the edges with, and here I was using some old, um, four by four posts that I had, but you can put rebar, you know, whatever you have, soil, <clears throat> hold it down, leave it in the Texas sun for three to six months if you can. What you're trying to do, I'm going to tell you a magic number, okay? This is a magic number in biology and horticulture, whatever. It is 140 degrees. What you are trying to do is you're trying to raise the temperature of that soil to 140 degrees as deep as you can do it, all right? If you can raise that soil to 140 degrees, it's going to kill 95% of the weed seeds or what they call the seed bank that's stored in your soil. 140 degrees is enough to kill seeds. It's enough to kill you. If you get in an oven and somebody cranks it up to 140 degrees, you're going to die, okay? Okay. And the other thing that's a good thing about 140 degrees, if you're making compost and you want to make compost very quickly, then you want to heat your compost pile up to 140 degrees. So 140 degrees is going to make everything break down as quickly as possible. It's also going to kill pathogens. So like I say, 140 degrees, magic number. So I am a big fan of solarization. If you follow my social media, Next week, I'm going to be making a video and, and demonstrating how to do this because this works. The other thing that works, you have to have a little more time is what I call smothering. So if you don't want to put the opaque material and let the heat bake something to death, then put something that you have. Put wood, put sheets of hardy plank, plywood, whatever it is that you have that's heavy and light will not penetrate. Lay it in place 
And that is that too is going to kill tons of weeds. And the longer you leave it there, the better it's going to last. Um, just kind of in case you're curious, the best smothering agent that I've ever encountered is a 40 foot shipping container. So if you want to make sure and kill everything in your yard, put a shipping container back there for six months and then move it. When my wife and I remodeled our house, that's exactly what we did. And for five or six years after we moved that shipping container, we had a 40 foot rectangle that you could clearly see in our backyard. So smothering also works. You just have to make sure you leave it in place long enough. The other one that I like is fire. I don't know in the city, this might not work as well, but it, I think it would be okay. I have what's called a pad burner or a no pull burner. It's just a big propane torch that you hook up to a propane tank and they use it in South Texas to burn the thorns off of the prickly pears and everything so the cattle can eat them. So that's why they're called a pad burner or a no pull burner. I have tons and tons of granite walk paths on my property. Granite is an incredible germination medium, okay? Every weed in the world wants to pop up in my decomposed granite. But since I don't like to spray chemicals, I can walk along my decomposed granite walkways with my pad burner and I can hit these plants with this fire. Now I don't have to burn the plant up. That is not what we're trying to do. What you're gonna do is you're gonna hit that plant until you see a noticeable change in the sheen or coloration of the plant. Because what you've done is you have just melted the waxy cuticle off which all plants have. And at that point, it's gonna have no ability con to control its transpiration and it will literally transpire or respire itself to death. It, it will lose all of its water. So these things are great, great, great chemical control methods. Now, after or those are manual and physical control methods. Finally, the last thing that we have We'll, we'll make a joke about, I tell people, people say you can use boiling water to kill weeds. Well, maybe very small weeds when they first pop up, but let's be honest, folks, it's 212 degrees, okay? In Texas, the sidewalk that you're on can be 140 degrees or 150 degrees. So there are weeds out there that boiling water is not going to touch. Another one that I read was horticultural molasses could be used to control nut sedge. With my experiment, it did kill, I killed a nut sedge with one jar of horticultural molasses, which cost me about $20. So I determined horticultural molasses may kill nut sedge. I'm not sure I can afford to use it though. All right. But the last one that I will tell you is acetic acid. Everybody talks about use vinegar, 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 vinegar. Okay, I'm gonna tell you household vinegar is 6% acetic acid and you can use it in your garden, but it's pretty much like the boiling water. It's not gonna be very effective. So if you want to use true killing power acetic acid, you need to go to your local nursery and they are gonna carry either 20 or 30% acetic acid. This is the organic gardener's roundup, okay? This will kill almost anything. Okay, it doesn't work real good against the woodies, so it's not going to work real good about against your poison ivies and things like that. But anything that is grassy or broadleaf, um, acetic acid will do a fine job. I do tell people though, this is truly an herbicide, and so you must be very careful when you spray and not get overspray on anything else because it will kill just as effectively as Roundup, and it, it will kill everything. So just be careful when you spray it. All right. So I went very quick. I am working very hard to keep my presentations under an hour. So y'all, I'm done. Okay. I want to thank you very much for having us. Um, here is our information. We love your questions. We love your comments. Feel free to email us anything. If we don't know the answers, we have a huge staff of, of professional horticulturalists that we work with. We can get you answers and everything. Um, feel free to call if you just want to chat. And like I say, I hope you take advantage of our 25% discount. And um, thank you. And I hope you'll have me back when we can get together in person. So, Angel. Um, yeah, I can take I can some take questions you. now. Yeah. Mary, yeah.
Yeah, we had a lot of questions come up in the chat. So we'll go through those now. Um, so Allie, uh, when we were talking about weeds at the beginning, uh, she's a farm manager over at FarmShare in Cedar uh -huh. Creek. And, um, you know, this year it was really important to leave some of those weeds. So she had mentioned that they like to leave some of the things like sorrel and henbit, um, just because the pollinators, that was some of the only flowers they had um, to pollinate on. And so are, would you recommend, like, what are some of the good sort of quote unquote weeds? Um, but, you know, she mentioned in general, they do weed, but there's some that are, that can be beneficial. So here is what, here, here's another thing that I like to say. It's your garden. You can do whatever you want to. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, I have weeds all over my garden. Okay, one of the weeds that I have in my flower beds is a Texas native called the Texas Star Daisy. All right, my wife doesn't like it. She's like, why don't you pull that? It's a weed. Well, it's a pretty flower too. I mean, I like it. So to me, a weed is simply a plant that has mastered all the things that it takes to survive, except learning how to grow in rows. So if that plant is doing you a service and it does not bother you, okay? So um, let's talk about henbit. A henbit, if you like it and it's bringing in the, the um, pollinators, I mean, it's another thing that it can do is it can serve kind of as a ground cover. So it can help moderate temperature and all of that. And I mean, this is the other thing, like Mary, when you read that thing, I thought that thing that you read about the bugs earlier was very good. It said, most of these bugs that come to our garden are transitory. Well, it's the same thing with weeds, if you want to call them weeds. These things are primarily transitory too, okay? They all have a season. And so if you're getting the pollinators in with your hen bits, I mean, people will leave dandelions. That, I like dandelions. I mean, and if you don't mind the little yellow flowers popping up in your yard, leave them. So I think if the weed serves you, it's a good plant. Um, yeah, I, I want to say that bare, bare dirt is really harmful. Um, yes. And so um, if, if you have things that are covering your bare dirt, such as weeds, that's preferable than bare dirt. That is, yeah, that is true. I personally, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah, there was someone that, that jumped in and didn't have their... We've been Sorry. trying to mute people because of... Slotting <laughs> <Swatty, laughs> <swatty> flies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, what were you saying? No, I'm, I'm with you. So I personally, I am somebody that likes everything very nice and neat and tidy. And so I, I pull and I chop and I complain and, and all of that. But you know, if it's serving your, if it's serving your purpose, I mean, there's a lot of, especially commercial places that I go to, they just don't have the resources to keep their ground weed free. And so, you know, like I say, if it works for you, feel free. And, mm -hmm. and especially like I say, bare soil is bad soil. If you can't mulch it, if you can't cover it, then you need to get something that's going to grow in there that's going to keep the even worse things down. So instead of telling you what are good weeds to grow, I will tell you bad weeds not to grow. And so like I had somebody call today and they wanted to know how to control stickers or sand burr grass. Uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, Actually yeah. fertilizer cures that. I'm sorry? Fertilizer cures that. It does? Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> But those seeds that get in the soil, they can persist for a very long time. And so it is, to me, that's a tough weed to control. Nutsedge is a, wor a tough weed to control, okay? Uh, like I have this, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm going blank, the native um, that I just talked about, spiderwort. It's horrible. So there are some- I love spiderwort. I love spiderwort too. But let me tell you what spiderwort will do. If you leave it alone in three or four months, it will completely take over a fairly substantial area. I love that. <laughs> well, I don't have that big a vegetable garden, so, so I, I need to get flowers, it out. They hold the dirt well. It's got a lot of good qualities. I love spiderwort. Uh, 
Well, that is but true. So I can understand if you're in the process. If you've got an incline and you're losing soil, then yeah, it's a great choice. Yeah. So let's get it's a native and, and pollinators like it. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, um, when you were talking about the soap, soapy water, um, someone asked, can you use just spray soap and water to get rid of the harlequins or do you have to dunk them or throw them in the soapy water? Yeah, unfortunately, when they're fully mature like that, you're going to have to you're going to have to drown them. You're going to have to dump them in there. Now, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with that, the best choice that you have is to then use some kind of oil mixture on them. You know, so you can use a, a horticultural oil or you can mix up your own olive oil and water with some soap in it. And then what you're hoping is that you're going to get enough oil on them that you're going to clog their, their respiration. They, they breathe through pores that are in their, in their sides. And so if you clog that, they will die. Okay, but really the most effective way that I found is just sit out there and pick them in and drop them in. Yeah. So, so, uh, and another thing, just just for fun, if, if you're kind of squeamish and you don't like doing that, you know what else works? A car vac. So you can literally go out and some of these pests that are big enough, like your harlequin bugs and your leaf footed bugs and everything, you can take your car vac and you can suck them up in a car vac too. <laughs> and then you don't have to handle them. Okay, so then uh, another question about um, aphids. So if you're spraying them off with water, do they make their way back onto the plant or do they drown? Um, and then once they hit the soil, they can't make their way back up to the plant? So that, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them on the ground Okay, they are not strong animals. Are you curious? I'm sorry. Margaret, can you mute yourself? S sorry, people unmuted keep talking. Oh, okay. So anyway, when you knock these aphids off, aphids live very close to where they are hatched from. So these are not migratory bugs that you know are gonna hop from plant to plant unless the plant is touching each other and they're on a leaf that touches a, a leaf for another plant. So you're trying to knock those aphids off of the plant and get them down on the ground because they're not strong enough to work their way back up to where they're gonna damage your plant, okay? And they're also incredibly soft bodied. And so if you have a tool that puts out a strong enough spray of water, I personally have a thing that I, I bought years ago and the, the company went out of, of business it was called the Mighty, the Mighty Fine Mister. And it's an aluminum rod that has a brass fitting on the end that points up and it's got a nozzle, kind of like a power washer nozzle, but it puts just enough pressure on it that it doesn't knock the leaves off of my tomato plants or my crepe myrtles or whatever. And so if you can hit them hard enough, you can kill them or you can stun them and make them fall and they will not be strong enough to climb all the way back up the plant again. Okay. One more angle on them. Uh, I hear that knocking them off uh, with a strong spray actually may leave their hey. straw-like mouth part off? stuck in the plant. Mm -hmm. So now the... Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry, can you unmute Forrest? I accidentally was trying to mute someone else and... Uh, saying, just saying that uh, knocking them off in, in, with that forceful water um, uh, I hear from university studies that it also knocks the bug off of its straw-like mouth part. And without that straw-like mouth part, the bug is no longer a pest. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna say that you're probably right. I'm gonna say that you're right on that, okay? So that's the thing. That's why you wanna get on them early and stay on them is you wanna get on them and get them before they get knocked off. But just kind of a neat little story to go along with that. Okay, when I was at AM, this just cracks me up. They were they wanted to study aphids and they wanted to see how much, I guess the you want to call it the, the carbohydrate that, that goes up and down the plant that aphids actually took out. And it was some graduate student's job to get plants infested with aphids and then go in and cut their little bodies off and leave those straws in there so that they could gather and measure how much honeydew uh, was being lost to these aphids. 
So I think you're probably right. I think you're probably true. Um, but I would think that it's probably going to clog itself after some time. I don't know this for a fact. Okay, right now I'm, I'm hypothesizing. But I would assume it's going to be kind of like a wound and the plant will have a way to eventually close that wound. So I, I don't think that it would be permanent. But it, it would probably act, serve the same purpose right after you knocked it off. It's permanent for the body that came off of that straw. I'm sorry? body that came off of that straw would be would go ahead and die yes yes because that's another thing because you just knocked its mouth off <laughs> okay so moving on to uh margaret marshall's question she wanted to know what suggestions do you have to control four line plant bugs and she said right now she's scouting every two hours squishing them I honestly, I'm going to be honest, I don't know that pest. What, four line what? Plant bugs. Is there another name, Mar Margaret, a uh, Latin or any other common name that you know? Let me. Let's see if uh, Margaret is still here. Are you still here, Margaret? I'll tell you what, Margaret, if you can hear me, I don't, I don't, I don't know that pest. But if you will email me, you know, Jay at Texas Gardener, I'll get you an answer. Okay. So one of the guys that, that writes for us and is a friend is a guy that's in, in charge of, of the pest program at AM, Dr. Kevin Ong. So send me some information, send me a picture, and I'll get you an answer. I, I, don't, I don't know that pest. Katie wrote, uh, we've got a little person here watching and raising their hands. Please know they're engaged even if Zoom is weird. <laughs> I like that comment. <laughs> We're doing the best we can with Zoom. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Payan asked, uh, do you sometimes accidentally trap beneficial bugs or things like lizards on the sticky traps? So I have, I have, yes, that is a true statement. So I don't trap very many lizards, okay? I'm, I'm going to tell you, so I use the sticky traps in my vegetable garden and now that you say that, I think it's kind of weird because I don't, I don't really notice a lot of lizards in my vegetable garden. But I do get beneficials. Um, but just I tell people, you have to realize if you're putting something out there to kill insects, I don't care if it's a synthetic um, pesticide, an organic pesticide, a sticky trap, whatever, it's going to kill more than bad bugs. There's, there's just no way around that. So... Um, if you want to catch the squash vine borer, you can put that around your squash plants and you will probably get her, but you may get some other moths and seraphid flies and things like that that came to pollinate that squash. So yes, but there is nothing that is so specific that it does not kill some beneficials. Okay. I'd say it's better to plant uh, the curbito, what it, brusqueto, whatever it's called, squash variety that's more resistant. So that you don't. Yeah. So just FYI, so that any vining squash, so this is, let's go back to the science stuff. Any vining squash, what they call winter squash or whatever. And just FYI, if you want Jay's favorite squash, I grow a squash every year called Tatume or Calabacita. And it's a little round softball shaped green squash. But if you leave it on the vine, it'll turn orange. It actually means little pumpkin in Spanish. It's an awesome, awesome um, squash. But the reason squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, anything in those vining families do not suffer from the squash vine borer like a yellow squash or a zucchini is because of how it grows. So if you let those plants vine along the ground, everywhere a node from one of those vining plants hits the ground, it's going to send down roots, okay? And so it's going to have several points along the ground where it's taking up water and nutrients, whereas your squash, it is a single point of contact in the middle of that bush. And so when that little bug burrows in there and eats out all of the xylem and phloem on the inside, there's nothing left to take water and nutrients to the foliage of that plant. And so that's why anything that vines, I will say nothing is immune to the squash vine borer, but they are much more resistant to the squash vine borer. 
And you can help that along by just putting a little dirt on top of those points so that it yeah, has yeah. Uh, more roots growing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I tell people too, you know, and this is for people like me who like things nice and neat. You really, if a squash vine is growing somewhere that you don't necessarily like, you know, because it doesn't look as pretty, but it's not hurting anything. If you pull it up, you're going to weaken that plant. You know, I mean, because literally everywhere that that thing is touching the ground, it's put a root in the ground to help feed and nurture that plant. Mm -hmm. So yeah. well, that's one that we uh, sell at our plant sale. And, um, you know, I hope more and more people save seeds and grow that yeah. one. Yeah, that's another good thing about the tatumi as it is heirloom. So you can save the seeds from it every year. Yellow squash and zucchini, you can't do that. Those, those are all open pollinated. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had a couple questions in here about pill bugs. And I know at Zilker Botanical, we've had a lot of problems. They've come with the mulch that we've been putting on top of the plants. And there was an argument too on a, one of the, the gardener groups online where people were like, they're only supposed to shred you know, decomposing matter. And I'm like, no, I have seen, you know, pill bugs like going through the fresh green plants. Um, yep. And so can you speak to kind of uh, your experience there and like some of the things we can do to mitigate pill bugs? So I don't know if, you know, I don't know if this will work for most of y'all. I saw some lady earlier who had a rooster sitting on her chair behind her. So I will say this is about the only good thing that my ducks and my chickens do for me is that they do like pill bugs. And so, and they, you know, get in the habit of following me into the garden. And so I can say that that is a, a control method. But other than that, you know, I mean, a pill bugs, it's kind of a, a pill bug likes dark and moist. So if you have a problem with it, the only thing that you can do to control it, if you want to say that, is make the environment unattractive to it. So, but if you have deep mulch and you keep everything well watered and everything, the pill bug is gonna be in there. And it is thought of as one of the decomposers that, that breaks down the dead material, but it will also eat soft tissue, so. Mm -hmm. um, could, it, could it be that there's an absence of decomposing material and that's why they eat green material? Um, I don't know. I think most animals like that are kind of um, opportunistic. That's and so. Fresh salad. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. But what I will say is that I've only noticed them really kind of eating on something that's been like damaged, you know, something that's already been broken or damaged or whatever. Or, or something. Or really at the end of the season, food. maybe. Yeah, I, I don't see it messing with mature plants. So. Yeah, it was, um, we were seeing it on um, newly planted watermelons that were transplants and also beans, pole beans that were around our, um, our uh, corn. Huh. And, our three and how are they mulched? And they were newly mulched. Huh. Oh, so maybe not decomposed. Yeah. yeah. So maybe yeah, that was it. Yeah. Zilker had brought in like a new batch. So it wasn't shredded enough. I guess. Or decomposed enough. Decomposed, yeah. What has really worked for me is uh, the beer traps. Uh huh. They, along Even with the snails, the, the um, pill bugs are really attracted into the beer traps, and their only problem was it caught so many. I was uh, dumping pill bugs and beer out uh, uh, every day, but huh. it, it really, it really cuts down the pill bugs. Now, I, I was not aware of that. That's very Do we really want to kill the decomposers? I mean, you know, that they're doing a function, but if we're killing them off, how, what's going to decompose things? <laughs> well, well balance, uh, I think. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pouring them into my compost, so they're helping me <laughs> make compost. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it, it gathers quite a few of them. Yeah. So um, on to Liz Cardinal's question. She wanted to learn more about uh, why neem is toxic. So, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, Have you ever smelled it? Oh my God. <laughs> it's the worst smell you've ever had in your life, neem oil. Yeah. You don't, um, 
I mean, I have a lot of Indian friends that, you know, that garden in the Houston area and they love neem oil. So make no mistake, you know, I mean, this is, it's kind of like their organic thing. They, it's their plant. They came up with it, but even they don't like to play, spread on the edibles. So when I say it's toxic, I don't know if it'll kill you, but I know that it doesn't taste good and it doesn't probably make you feel good. So, um, so, but I, I mean, you know, I've used neem oil. I, I use neem oil quite a bit, but I just kind of avoid it in the vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. So Susan asked about, um, is there any um, kind of chemical control for keeping squirrels away besides puddles and, or, you know. So just so you know, we're going to have a very good article on squirrel control coming up in Texas Gardener in two or three issues. So be sure and subscribe today. But um, there's your plug. All right. There's my plug. <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, squirrels are tough. I mean, squirrels, they're tough. There's, I I'm going to say no. <laughs> I mean, you can put things out. You know, supposedly they don't, you can put out animal urine that will, you know, scare them off or whatever. Dogs and cats. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's a good, now that is a good point. Okay. I mean, a dog and a cat, a, a, you know, but there's pluses and minuses to everything. Okay. So like we have feral cats here. And so Feral cats are good at keeping a lot of the mice down and everything, especially me. You know, I've got chickens, I've got ducks, so I've got feed, and I don't have a lot of mice. But today, my wife had a wren that had nested in a pot on our back porch, and she hadn't seen that wren today, and she's worried sick that one of those cats got that wren or got those babies. So there are pluses and minuses, you know, but a cat and a dog, they are pretty good about keeping squirrels kind of contained in their area my squirrels run around the perimeter of the fence top and yeah. the dogs are barking at them chasing them <laughs> yeah and you probably got possums that do it at night too maybe yeah if y'all want to do something fun this is just they're cheap now they, they have really good cameras buy a game camera buy a game camera and put it in your backyard it is fascinating what you will see <laughs> so. so um i was just going to mention um excuse me oh, no. i was going to mention the chicken wire cloches that we use at the teaching gardens um they're on they're from gardeners.com and we use those on our strawberries and um chicken wire has been a great defense against squirrels yeah <laughs> And pretty much um, that's the kind of stuff that they're going to talk about in that article. Um, it's just that the lady that's writing it has figured out a bunch of homemade barriers or mechanical control methods, if we want to go back to the talk, to help control the squirrels. Awesome. So, the um, squirrels are tough, especially on fruit trees, you know, because your fruit trees are so big. And um, so it's just very hard to even get nets around them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So. So Katie Jo Wright uh, asks, any special suggestions for gardeners that keep beehives um, in the garden? As far as what? I mean, I'm, I wish all gardeners could keep beehives in their garden. What, what is the concern? Katie Jo, do you want to elaborate? Are you still here? I guess not. Okay. What was the, the only thing that I will, I will say, okay? Spinosad will kill bees. Sticky traps will catch bees. Um, the water traps will, the water traps are not so bad for bees and all because bees are not as active at night. All right, but you will occasionally catch bees in, in the water traps as well. So if you have bees in your garden, then maybe you need to look at just doing physical control methods and, and things like that to, to try to control whatever it is that's bugging you. See what I did? That was a pun. Uh, <laughs> so. 
So uh, Janet Buckingham asks, uh, she asks deer, since we're talking about squirrels, <laughs> how do you prevent them from eating your plants? It's all mechanical, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, so, you know, I'm really, I I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm kind of lucky. So I grow between two ranches. So I live on a little narrow strip, strip of property and I've got a cattle ranch behind me and a cattle ranch in front of me. And they both got woods on them. And I don't understand why I don't have deer. And I think the main reason that I have, do not have deer in my gardens is because so many of my neighbors do have dogs. And so, you know, I, I know that the, the deer don't like the dogs. And then the other thing is just a weird thing is that we're in a wide open space and the two treat areas are, are far apart. So I know deer don't like to be out in the open too much for too long, but, um, but I don't know where you live. So my daughter lives in Wimberley and she lives in a neighborhood where the deer are protected and there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing that, that they can do. The, the only thing that they can do, like I say, is they grow agaves and they grow oleanders um, and, and things like that, that the deer won't eat, but there is not, there's just not much you can do to beat a deer. Mm -hmm. So we're in their neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they don't like, but they don't like onions and garlic. <laughs> so you can yeah. become an onion farmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. um, if you don't have too many um, fruit trees, I found that just a four foot tall um, welded wire, rabbit fencing um, Oh, you got muted. You're muted, Forrest. It, it won't, the deer won't jump into a um, circle of fence that has a tree in the middle of it uh, because they're not going to jump into that tree. Huh. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that, but that makes sense. Um, that would be worth trying. All I know is that the average deer can jump higher than the average house. And that has to do with the fact that deer are incredibly um, athletic and the average house can't jump. So that's another joke, mm -hmm. but deer are tough. I mean, literally there's not, my father-in-law used to garden and he had an eight foot fence and the deer would still get in his garden. Mm. So um, unfortunately I don't have any good control. I mean, Human hair, uh, I've heard all of that stuff, but none of it's effective for long. Hmm. So Kim asks, what's the best thing for white flies on citrus? So my thing with, the only thing that ever works for me on any kind of white fly, thrip, anything like that is some of the oil solutions. And neem oil is one of them. Okay, you, you can put neem oil out there, but you're going to have to hit them a lot because white flies, they reproduce very, very quickly and they have a very short life cycle. And so, you know, you need to get out there and you're going to have to spray probably at least once a week for two or three weeks and, and maybe more. But the oils for me have, have worked okay. And we have, we have horrible white flies, not just on our I don't really have them on my citrus, but I get them on my roses. I get horrible white flies on my roses and, and we have them right up by the house. And so it's a pain every time we go in and off of the porch. And so the, the oils, the, the neem oil. I also, I like horticultural oils like that we put on the um, fruit trees to con control the curculios and, and all of that. You can spray those too. And, and if you don't spray them too heavy, they won't hurt most plants. Mm -hmm. um, so okay um jill asked do you use diatomaceous earth in the garden i do not use diatomaceous earth in the garden but i can see where it would be useful especially you know when we were talking about knocking off the aphids and everything or if you knocked off some of these smaller stages of, of some of the growth i use dot i use de i have a hard time saying that i just call it de but I use it in my chicken coops and in my chicken pens. And I use it to control mites and, and things like that. But no, I, I do not personally use it in my garden. 
I make a little dish with the diatomaceous and the birds take a uh, dust bath in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Julia, she talks about the timing of planting and, I, and that having to do with the success of squash and I can- Yes. Name, uh, you know, we were putting some of the first squash that Gabriel Valley grew um, in Zilker this year. And we, you know, we've got some beautiful squash, but, you know, timing things up seasonally seems to help there. Um, and, and, and not just squash's case, I'm sure. Everything. It's not just squash. So this is one of those, that's a very good, I, whoever said that is a good gardener. So in Texas, Texas is a, a unique place in that, you know, what we're trying to beat is heat. Okay, so a lot of people don't understand this. I mean, but we're going to talk about bugs and I'm going to get there. But most pollen, most pollen, large pollen grains, especially pollen grains like squash and things like that. Do you ever wonder why your squash puts producing, even if it doesn't get eaten up by bugs? It's because it gets so hot that the pollen grains literally explode inside of these plants. And for most plants, that range is somewhere between 90 and 100 degrees. And so no matter how good you take care of the plants, once it gets to a certain heat, the pollen's gonna explode, there'll be no pollination, you won't get any more fruit, okay? And so in Texas, we are always trying to beat that. So where we live around here, that magic die date is somewhere around July 4th, okay? If your tomatoes, now I'm not talking cherry tomatoes and currant tomatoes and all that, but I'm talking your big and medium sized tomatoes. If they're not done by July 4th, the weather is gonna make them done very, very soon after that, okay? So now let's go back to your squash, let's go back to your tomatoes, so on and so forth. If you wanna beat the squash vine borer, if you wanna get a big tomato to grow before it gets too hot and the shoulders split and all of that, then what you need to do is you need to learn how to grow your transplants inside and you need to have those transplants where they're already in flower or in, in fruit set when you put them outside. Okay, so like my tomatoes, I plant my tomatoes on December 15th. Most people don't plant their tomatoes until sometime in January. I've heard as late as January 31st in ours. I plant mine in December 15th because I wanna put fully mature plants into the garden that already have flowers and even tiny fruit on them if I can. Same thing with squash. Find your variety of squash, Find how long you need to start it beforehand. If it's three weeks, if it's four weeks, you can put it out there. You know, once it gets flower, it's gonna start setting fruit before that squash vine borer ever emerges from the soil. And do y'all know what a squash vine borer looks like in the soil? If you're digging in the soil and you find a little brown cocoon, it's probably a squash vine borer. Okay, so you need to squish that. So you need to watch and find out when those things start maturing. Because if you can get that squash in the ground and get it up, get it in flower, get it setting fruit before that thing even emerges, then you're probably going to get at least some squash harvest before the bug wipes you out. And this is what I like to do. So I, the only way I grow squash anymore is under cover. And you do have to self-pollinate it and it's not hard. But once you get fruit set on these squash, they generally, I'm not going to say the vine borer is not going to kill it, but you'll at least get a decent harvest before the thing will kill it. So whoever said that, yes, I, I'm applauding you. That is what we're managing in Texas. You are trying to get all of those plants out there as early as possible to ultimately beat the heat. But you also can do it. You can manage the life cycle of these pests. So very that is... A, Awesome comment. I wished I was there. I would give you a planning guide or uh, something. That, that was an awesome comment. I'm, I'm very um, flattered that you think that's a great comment. Thank you, Jay. Oh, well, you're welcome. Because that is um, very, that's one of those differences between a good gardener and a great gardener. So. Okay, do we have uh, any other questions? that we didn't get answered from the chat? Well, we really wanna appreciate how interactive everybody's been and uh, 
uh, Jay for coming on Zoom and uh, <laughs> and visiting with us tonight. We had a really great time and um, what an excellent evening. Yeah, and we want to encourage everyone to take advantage of that coupon code. I'm going through the chat to try to find it again. <laughs> um, here well, we go. Just um, can I go and pop it up real quick? You're going to put yeah. it on YouTube. But it's very easy. It's AOG, so Austin Organic Gardeners, and then today's date. So there you um, go. Here's the crypto cryptograph. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not smart. I put it in the chat. So um, everyone, take that down. And yeah, we really appreciate your time tonight. And so informative. Lots of good discussion. And um, I shared the link to the YouTube. We'll have it up on our website, on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe. Um, so if you want to share it out to other folks that um, could, could use some of these tips, be sure to share our content. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate everyone coming out tonight, making us part of your Monday night. And uh, what's our next one for June? Are we going to have an ice cream social? Yeah, so we're still, I'm still kind of working on the, the, the topic. Um, right now, it's between, um, I'm talking with someone from the Indian plant gardeners. And we were thinking about doing a, um, and I was going to help her out too. Like she was going to do a garden tour and just talk about the challenges of growing plants and doing, you know, doing uh, gar gardening, you know, within the Indian plant community. Indian plants. Yes. Well, I think we ought to have a little social time because that's normally what we do yeah, in June. Like maybe we don't make it so long. Like maybe the tour is maybe 30 minutes and then we do our ice cream social, which is what we usually do in June, right? We do. Um, so maybe we can encourage people to bring their own ice cream and maybe break up into groups and have like a little uh, game or something according to your neighborhood. That sounds great. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good plan. And um, I, I'm still working on trying to find a speaker. Um, I'm going to reach out to Jeff Ferris from Gardening Naturally about maybe talking about uh, how to protect our soil when things really, really start to heat up. So July. Excellent. Uh, I love seeing everybody when you take your, uh, you put your camera on and wave. It's so awesome to see your face because otherwise we were talking to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Well, we hope to see everybody next month and, uh, you know, get your ice cream selection lined up. You. We'll remind everybody through email. And if you aren't signed up uh, for our newsletter, it's free. You don't have to even be a member. You can sign up on our website. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, Jay. That was a great talk and we appreciate your time. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much, Jay. And thank you, thank you. Mary and Angel for organizing. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.